All right. Hello, YouTube. My name is Alan. It's that time again. Let's talk some metal. Tonight, we're going to be talking about one band and their influence on a whole lot of other bands. And that band is, of course, the mighty Queensryche. Uh, when Queensryche made this first, you know, essentially just a demo that was turned into an EP that immediately got them signed to a major label with EMI, they uh, quickly established, you know, a very unique sound among American heavy metal bands of the time. You know, this first EP is excellent. It does show off a lot of worship and fondness for Judas Priest, early Iron Maiden and such. But of course, uh, Queensryche, while having a bunch of talented musicians, their secret weapon was, of course, Jeff Tate, classically trained vocalist, you know, with an amazing range, great sound. Um, and, you know, they would move from strength to strength, leaping forward with, you know, The Warning, their first full-length album, which again, you know, had an interesting production, great tracks throughout it. They, and again, they were sort of carving their own path a little bit, while you would probably describe this as traditional metal or early U.S. power metal. They weren't doing a lot of songs that were just, you know, heavy metal will live forever, huzzah. Uh, they were avoiding all the medieval fantasy tropes and, you know, the silly, you know, BDSM ladies in leather songs. And you're know, doing something that was more thoughtful, more cerebral, more mature. Uh, lots of ways that you could describe it. And this, of course, continued as they went on to Rage for Order, uh, establishing you know, a very different aesthetic look from what other bands were doing. And again, just continue doing this more you know, thoughtful brand of oh, solid heavy metal, but very polished sounding, um, you know, a lot of you know, talent on display. And they would, of course, you know, in most people's minds, peak with Operation Mind Crime. And after that, you know, they would sort of slowly extend until they were out of the orbit of the metal universe and do other things. But uh, Queensryche's influence on a ton of heavy metal bands cannot be underestimated. You know, sometimes when we're discussing metal bands, we are bad to fall into that pattern of saying like, oh, you know, their influences were Iron Maiden and Judas Priest. And this other band was influenced by Judas Priest and Iron Maiden. But this other band, they were influenced by Priest and Maiden, maybe a pinch of Sabbath. Um, we forget that Queensryche had a big influence on a lot of bands. And there were many acts, especially in the United States, who tried to emulate that Queensryche sound. Uh, some of them did it better than others. There were several that did very, very well. None of them necessarily had the same level of success as Queensryche. Uh, again, you know, the originators are often going to do the best when they establish a sound like that. But these other bands do deserve a shout out. And again, you know, the style they were playing, I've never really heard a distinct name for it. It was never given like a micro genre. I would hesitate to call these clone bands. They weren't trying to copy Queensryche note for note or anything, but they were definitely trying to capture that same vibe. And these bands, they tend to have traits in common. The level of musicianship tends to be very high. The songwriting quality tends to be very high. They're not just slapping together, you know, teenage anthems of, you know, being, you know, mad at the man or drinking beer or, you know, racing cars or anything like that. You know, they're putting a lot more effort and thought into lyrics and riffs and songwriting. They also tend to be highlighted by vocalists who are trained singers. They can sing in a higher register. Again, trying to do what Jeff Tate was did, uh, could do. Not as well, of course, but some of them could definitely hold their own. Um, so yeah, there tends to be a lot of you know, talent on display with these kind of bands. So instead of just focusing on Queensryche, who everybody knows, you don't need me to play Queensryche clips for you, we're going to check out a few bands that were in that Queensryche mold of US heavy metal. Uh, a couple of these are pretty well known, a couple of these not so well known. And we'll start in just a second, as soon as I get my cat to stop misbehaving. Hey, Kitty. Ugh, that cat can be a real pain sometimes. Sorry for the interruption. Now, 
let's move on. We'll start off with a very well-known band. Uh, they've got a lot of true metal cred over the years. Career almost got off the ground. They they had some chances and things never quite they never quite got over the hump and realized their full potential. Uh, this is one of the bands that most often gets compared to Queensryche. And I'm talking, of course, about Crimson Glory out of Florida. Uh, Crimson Glory did several albums. The one I've got here is my personal favorite. It's their self-titled debut. This one came out on the Par Records label originally. It's the same uh, Florida-based record label that helped launch the career of Sabotage. They released Pretty Maids. Uh, first material in the United States. So Par definitely you know, had some quality stuff on their label. The big thing with Crimson Glory, again, they have all those traits I mentioned, you know, excellent songwriting, really good musicians, and their secret weapon was also in their vocalist, uh, who went by the name of Midnight. And before we ramble on anymore, let's go ahead and check out uh, one of my personal favorite Crimson Glory tracks off the self-titled album. This one kicks your ass as soon as the needle hits the wax. It's Dragon Lady. That is Crimson Glory just killing it on the Immortal Dragon Lady. I love the way that song opens, that cool little guitar lick, and then that just sinister cackle before it just starts that rolling, catchy riff. Uh, showcases everything that you want in a band playing this style. Great guitar work, great thoughtful song writing put together extremely well, and magnificent vocals from Midnight. Let's see. Crimson Glory did have a gimmick, as you saw when I held up the back cover. Uh, early on in their career, they wore these full silver face masks. Those eventually were replaced with masks that covered half the face, and eventually they got rid of the masks altogether. But yeah, it was sort of a you know, theatrical gimmick to go along and give them a little bit of a unique appearance and vibe. And Crimson Glory, again, they did pretty well for themselves. They got picked up by Roadrunner Records and released Transcendence, which is the album most people gravitate to. And it's the one that I hear discussed and get the most praise. Very good album. Again, it features all the same excellent qualities about the band. Uh, personally, uh, there's just some of the tracks on the self-titled, like Dragon Lady and Azrael, and that are my personal favorites. So that's the album I reach for the most often. Um, Crimson Glory did a second album for Roadrunner that didn't come out until 91. I don't think I gave the dates for these. So the self-titled came out in 86. The Transcendence album was 88. And then 91 is when their third album came out, which was called Strange and Beautiful. The strange part is very accurate. Beautiful, maybe less so. Um, strange and beautiful perfectly encapsulates the identity crisis that heavy metal in the United States started to have around 1991. Um, it's the album doesn't you know really have those same features as the first two albums. It sounds like a very different band by this point. There are still some good songs 
on it, but it's definitely in one way trying to lean in a more commercial direction with uh, ballads like uh, Song for Angels, which is a pretty ballad by a heavy metal band. I'll give it that. Uh, but a lot of the songs, they either just fail to be memorable or it's like the songwriting just doesn't gel somehow. The cover art uh, is just a weird mess of color. Um, yeah, it was a very weird album. I remember people being sort of confused by it, disappointed, just kind of like, what the heck is this? Wow. Is this really the same band? How many lineup changes have happened? Something just seemed very amiss at that point. But uh, a lot of things were going amiss in American heavy metal around that point in 91. So that was it for Crimson Glory at that point. They got back together. Uh, they tried, I think, to get together once or twice, never quite got off the ground. But in the late 90s, double checking the day, but yeah, 1999, they did get another album out called Astronomica. And this featured a different vocalist, Wade Black. I, my understanding, I'm, I'm a little fuzzy on the details here, but I think they had tried to get back together with Midnight, but it never quite worked out. There were reports of substance abuse problems, uh, an arrest for drunk driving with a suspended license, things like that. So yeah, they ended up recruiting Wade on vocals for Astronomica. At the time, Astronomica got mixed reviews, but at least somewhat positive reviews. And I feel like over time, maybe the album just hasn't aged well for folks, but it seems to get a lot more crap these days than it did upon its release. You know, when it came out, you know, of course, it was not Transcendence Part 2. Uh, it was not going to be that without Midnight on vocals. But personally, I didn't think it was a bad album. I bought it. I had it. I played it a fair amount back in the day. I no longer have a, co a physical copy of it. I think I've still got it on the hard drive. You know, it still shows off pretty good songwriting. The songs are a little all over the place. Uh, they feel a little scattered. It's like they had a lot of ideas, but maybe didn't quite get them all to come together the way they wanted. And you can tell some of the material was definitely written with Midnight in mind. Uh, songs like War of the Worlds were meant to be sung by Midnight with this higher register. He could have really nailed, you know, the chorus on that. You know, Wade Black's vocals aren't bad, but he's a different kind of singer. It's a little bit similar to the problem that Iron Maiden ran into with Blaze Bailey. It's not that Blaze was a bad singer. <clears throat> he didn't have the same kind of range that Bruce Dickinson had. And so you know, Wade didn't sound quite right performing some of those tracks that were obviously written before midnight. Wade was singing material written for another vocalist and doing his best with it. So yeah, the Astronomic album doesn't get much love these days. And if folks aren't into it, that's fine. I'm just a little surprised that it definitely seems to draw more heat now than it did 20 years ago when it first came out. The band had tried again to get back together and reform in the mid 2000s. I think they were again looking at trying to get Midnight back in the fold. And supposedly some material was recorded, but uh, never saw an official release. Midnight, of course, unfortunately passed away years ago. Um, the band did at least one tribute show at Prague Power after his passing with a bunch of different guest vocalists. While you know they only had you know two classic albums you know midnight was a big influence on a lot of vocalists uh, his performance on those first two crimson glory albums is very fondly remembered and rightfully so he had a great voice and it's a real shame that he's no longer with us all right so from crimson glory let's move on to our second band and from florida we've got to head a little bit north <clears throat> but just a little bit up to kentucky I have mentioned at least one other heavy metal band from Kentucky, not named Panopticon. Uh, so I guess this is number three. So the Bluegrass States got a little metal, little steel in their veins there. Not just steel guitar on the banjos and such. Uh, we're talking about Lethal here. And Lethal formed relatively early in the 1980s, but it took them a long time to do anything. They only made this one album, came out on Metal Blade, it's called Programmed, and it was a 1990 release. But again, the band had been kicking around since I think as early as 1982. 
they demoed some material in 1987 with a, a four track demo. Let's check the notes here while we're doing it. Uh, no, actually, yeah, four track demo, same tracks were on both sides of the cassette. And really strong material, very much in the tradition of Queensryche. Uh, again, vocalist with great range, very strong songwriting skills. And it was a very impressive demo. To this day, I think it's one of the strongest demos that an American heavy metal band produced in the 1980s. So let's go ahead and check out one of the tracks from the demo. This is a song called Land of the Free. This one did not uh, get put back on the album unless I'm really forgetting something. Yeah, this one was not did not appear on the album. Some of the demo tracks did, but this one didn't. It's still an excellent track, though. So here's a little bit of Land of the Free from Kentucky's Lethal. <laughs> is a clip of Land of the Free by Lethal from their demo. Again, excellent demo, really strong vocal performance. And uh, Lethal obviously working in that Queensryche style of very polished but very solid heavy metal. They could have caught on and really sort of you know, ridden the wave of success that Queensryche was experiencing. This demo came out in 87. If they had you know, jumped on a label right away, you know, they might have gotten some attention since Operation Mindcrime was coming out and exploding really big. Unfortunately, it was about three years before this first album came out. It came out on Metal Blade Records. And again, so by then you're in you know, 1990 heading into 91 and you know, Queensryche is you know, kind of done their thing and moving on to the promised land and heavy metal in the United States is starting to fall out of vogue. So yeah, this is a band that missed the boat, unfortunately. Uh, they did record some more material. They did an EP around 95. They did another album called Poison Seed in 96. And that album, even when it came out, was almost universally reviled. The few places that bothered to review it gave it just scathing reviews. The band had changed you know, direction quite a bit. I don't remember for sure, but very likely there were some lineup changes. And they were almost just you know, playing some kind of you know, grungy, you know, 90s metal-y sounding whatever. It was not at all what fans of you know, this kind of heavy metal wanted to hear from the band. Uh, they got back together at least once with that same lineup from around the uh, Your Favorite God and Poison Sea era, recorded some stuff, but it never got released. And if it sounded like that material, probably a good idea it wasn't released. Um, I don't think I've ever met anybody who really liked that material. So a real shame that Lethal couldn't have gotten signed and gotten an album cranked out just a couple of years earlier. Those two crucial years there from 1988 to 1990 might have made all the difference in the world uh, to this band. And this one, just on a personal note, this was a blind buy 
by me. Uh, and yeah, the price sticker is original. Finders Records uh, was a really cool record store in uh, the town where I was going to college at the time. Uh, there was a better indie store. This was kind of the bigger store, but they did have cool stuff. This was in the used bin one point. I was looking at it, and of course, you look at this cover, and it does not inspire you to buy it. It's a pretty bad Metal Blade uh, piece of cover art. But it was on Metal Blade, and I had heard the name mentioned probably in the pages of Sentinel Steel somewhere. So I'm just like, uh, $7 to a broke college student. That's like, do I buy it? Do I not buy it? So it's like, you know, it's a Metal Blade release. It rings a bell. It got a positive review somewhere that registered in the back of my brain. To hell with it. I'll buy it. I'm very glad I did. Uh, excellent album. So Lethal's Programmed, another band in that Queensryche style that could have been a thing. Their timing was just a little bit off. All right. Band number three on our lineup of Queensryche clones this evening. Another band that got very, very close to going over the top and just didn't quite get there for whatever reason. Uh, this is Seattle's Air Apparent. Um, Air Apparent, the original cover art for Graceful Inheritance is one of the albums uh, back there behind my head on the wall. Cool album cover. Air Apparent is one of the bands that most often gets mentioned as coming closest to the Queensryche sound. You're right there in the same geographic location in the Pacific Northwest of the US. And they got, you know, their first album came out a little bit earlier. They beat Crimson Glory and Lethal to the punch. I'm thinking Graceful Inheritance came out in 86. Let's double check our notes here. Try to get our facts straight for everybody who's watching this. Yeah, Graceful Inheritance came out in 1986 on Black Dragon Records, a French label that did, you know, a lot of good releases. And this is a later reissue with different cover art. This is uh, a CD press on Hellion Records. So yeah, they absolutely did a very good job copycatting what Queensryche had done. And let's check out just how good they were at it with a track from the Graceful Inheritance album called Another Candle. is Air Apparent with another candle, magnificent track off their debut album called Graceful Inheritance on the Black Dragon label from 1980, what did I say, 1986? Ah, I've already forgot. Been doing a lot of stuff this morning. Hard to keep everything straight. Yeah, 1986. All right, so Air Apparent doing that Queensryche style of heavy metal really, really well. Uh, 
this really was almost like a third path for metal bands at this point. By 1986, you know, American heavy metal was very much split into, you know, bands going in that, you know, sort of commercial MTV direction and bands going into, you know, the heavier, you know, thrash direction and even, you know, getting ready for some early death metal. And these bands, you know, they walk a path in between. They you know, they have some commercial appeal, as, you know, Queensryche showed with their success, but they're definitely not going for, you know, a ton of FM radio play necessarily. Uh, at the same time, you know, yeah, they're not going for mosh pits and, you know, things like that either. So uh, it's a different path for a band to follow. Now, Air Apparent uh, had lineup issues like so many bands did. They recorded some demos over the next couple of years, and those have been collected on uh, another Hellion CD release called Triad. So you can hear some of the stuff that they were doing after Graceful Inheritance. Graceful Inheritance, before I move off of it, I should say, you know, this is an album people are a little split on. Some people do consider it sort of a minor classic from the era. Other people are not too keen on this. You know, I think I've heard uh, Aaron, the metal theologian, mention that he's never been a big fan of Graceful Inheritance. I will say the album ran a bit too long. There are a ton of songs, even on the original release. And while there are a lot of good tracks on it, it felt like an album that needed to be pruned down quite a bit. That if they had, you know, kept to maybe 10 tracks, nine tracks or so, they would have had you know, a really, really solid uh, track list. But it got a little bloated. And so by the time you get to the end of the album, it almost feels like, okay, that took a while to get to the end of, which you know, can dampen your impressions of the record. But anyway, they went on, they recorded some you know, very good demo material with a new lineup, and they did get another album out back in the day as well. Uh, by this time, they had moved on to Metal Blade Records, and in 1989, they put out their One Small Voice record. Uh, strange album cover. And this definitely tells you that, again, the band is you know, leaning maybe more in that you know, progressive end of the metal spectrum, although it's still pretty straightforward in the Queensryche vein. Um, this album doesn't get mentioned a whole lot, but... Personally, I've always liked it. It's got you know, a good mix of songs, some a little faster, some a little slower, some more ballady. Uh, the track that probably gets the most attention on here is there's a cover of Simon and Garfunkel's The Sound of Silence, which they do an excellent job covering. A lot of times, you know, the cover song is sort of a throwaway. Maybe it's a neat novelty, but I think they really do a very, very nice uh, version of it on here. Uh, so yeah, I like this album quite a bit it's not something i play all the time but i think it deserves you know a bit more attention and accolades than it often gets now air apparent there have been a lot of different you know collection compilations that have been put out over the years so it's not hard to check out their stuff you don't have to go track down the originals that metal blade cd that one i just showed i'm almost certain is a bootleg copy uh, but yeah, you can track their stuff down. The band did put out an album in 2018 called The View From Below. I am not familiar with that album. I can't speak to it, haven't heard it, so I don't know what was going on with that album. But yeah, another band that you know, had the talent, they were following that Queensryche blueprint, but somehow just didn't quite get there. All right, we've got one last one to mention for our sort of Queenreich copyright. Uh, wow, that's, wait, pretty complicated to say. Queensreich copycat uh, lineup tonight. And digging deep for this one, a uh, band I don't think I've heard anyone else ever mention, except maybe over on the uh, Coruscant boards. It's a group out of Baltimore, Maryland called Apollo Ra. They did a couple of demos in 1989, never got a record deal, uh, doesn't look like any of the members went on to other projects much, so it just kind of faded into obscurity, but the, uh, one of the demos, Ra Pariah, did get a vinyl pressing in 2000 on the OPM record label out of Georgia. OPM Records was really good. Their specialty was finding bands from, especially like, you know, maybe the late 80s and into the early 90s that had recorded material but never put it out. And they would do uh, limited vinyl pressings. I don't think they ever did any CD pressings that I can think of. 
So yeah, OPM did stuff like the Iron Cross LP out of Florida. Uh, they did the Deuce material, um, stuff like that. Uh, a lot of cool material dug up by OPM records. So they weren't really reissues because the material often had never been issued in the first place, except maybe as demo cassettes. And Raw Pariah is one of the best ones that OPM dug up and got released. Let's go ahead and check out a clip, let you hear it for yourselves. This is the track Crimson Streets from Ra Pariah's demo by Apollo Ra. great track from Apollo Ra called Crimson Streets off of their Ra Pariah demo pressed on vinyl by OPM Records. Uh, showed some of the inserts and stuff there while the record clip was playing. OPM Records is defunct at this point. Uh, they're not putting out stuff anymore. They always work with the bands to make sure that you know they use stuff with permission, that you know members got paid and stuff like that, which was always cool of them. So yeah, real shame that Apollo Ra didn't get any more material out. I don't know what happened again. They may be showing up at just the wrong time. They're around 89. And by the time you got to 90, 91, may not have been a lot of labels looking to sign a band like this, unfortunately. The material has gotten uh, another reissue. I think No Remorse uh, gave it its first CD pressing around 2015. So you don't have to track down the OPM vinyl. You can also look for the No Remorse instead. A lot of those older OPM pressings are a bit hard to find and can some of them get a little expensive these days. They usually did limited runs on colored vinyl also. Uh, mine's just on black vinyl, but the Apollo Rod did come on like a really pretty sort of orangey gold yellow vinyl also. So if you've got that one, your copy is cooler than mine. Good for you. But yeah, uh, cool band. Apollo Ra's sound uh, actually probably leans closer to Crimson Glory than just Queensryche. That intro soft interlude part reminds me the most of Air Apparent. But then once the song gets going, it reminds me of the more aggressive material by Crimson Glory. Um, one reviewer, it's probably uh, posted over on Metal Archives, if I remember right, compared it to like, you know, they sound a lot like um, if you took Red Sharks by Crimson Glory and had Crimson Glory play an entire album with that kind of intensity, that's the Apollo Ra album. And that's a pretty fair description, in my opinion. So yeah, uh, another great band. And that's where we're going to call it to an end this evening. 
if you're a fan of those classic 80s Queensryche albums and you've always wished that there was some more material or some more bands you could check out that did something similar, there you go. You've got your homework from the professor. Go and get started. Dig some of those up and enjoy some Air Apparent, Crimson Glory, Lethal, and do not overlook Baltimore's Apollo Ra either. Now, it's time to talk metal in the comments down below. There are a lot of other bands that followed in the footsteps of Jeff Tate and tried to emulate that Queensryche formula. What are some of your favorite bands that are in that same Queensryche mold? Again, very different from what a lot of other bands did, but it's its own niche and a lot of bands followed suit. There's a lot more that I like as well. This is a topic I may revisit for another video and we'll do a round two someday. But let me know what bands you like. I'm sure there are a bunch I've never heard of. So I'm trying to point you all to some cool music you may not know about, but you can do the same. Point me and other folks who read the comments towards some of your favorite bands that maybe wanted to be Queensryche, didn't quite get there, but still made some quality material nevertheless. All right, with that, I am signing out. Everybody take care, and as always, keep banging your head.